again, sorry for the delay. I hope uh, it doesn't crash on me now and uh, we can get started. Hello and welcome to this Blink on session on shipping Color V1 in Chrome. Color V1 is a new vector color font format that we have been working on in collaboration with Blink, Google Fonts, Bedard, Esferbot, and Peter Constable and others from Microsoft. In this talk, I'm going to revisit briefly what color fonts are useful for. What do color fonts really mean? Then we go into details on how the color V1 format works. And I'm going to explain why and which new use cases it can enable on the web. I'm going to explain how it's implemented in Chrome and where we are with shipping it in Chrome. And I'll give a brief outlook on what comes next. Let's take a look at what color fonts are and what they are useful for. Of course, it's been possible for a long time to colorize text from an outline font and place it on the screen in different colors. Here's an example of the lobster font in, in gray and in green. And a well-known and popular use case for color fonts are, of course, emoji, as in this example of the National Park emoji as part of the Noto emoji set. But color fonts are, powerful, are a powerful means for, of creative expression, not only for emoji. Here, a decorative color font called Bungie, made by David Jonathan Ross, is demoed. Bungie was inspired by hairline, uh, sorry, by shop signs and street banners and features a small hairline running through the glyph center. It can be configured then, of course, to use multiple color tones, two-tone variations, and make it look extruded or use shadow. Also, color gives more depth to icon fonts. For example, in this case, the material two-tone icons of a satellite, a terminal application, or the swipe gesture. Or in the context of Arabic script, color is used to simulate the ink effects of Arabic calligraphy in this Arabic Qfix style uh, typeface called Liam Kufi made by Khaled Hosni. So here you see the ink effects um, kind of in, in the darkening towards the end of these glyphs. So let's talk about the color V1 format. So far, bitmap fonts, for example, Apple's SBIX and Google's CBDT, CBLC, have been used for making popular emoji color fonts. Apple's emoji font is a bitmap font. Google's Noto is a bitmap um, font in the CBDT CBLC format. Also, OpenType SVG exists as a font format that encodes color vector graphics. However, in OpenType SVG, we found issues with space efficiency, implementation complexity, and integration with existing font com formats with that format. So we designed the color v1 format to address these issues. Let's take a look at how the color v1 format works and how efficient it is at encoding color vector glyphs. Glyphs in color v1 are a directed acyclic graph of paint operations. For each glyph, the color table of the font contains a recipe of drawing operations to be executed in a particular order by sending these instructions to a 2D graphics library. The 2D graphics library can be Cairo, Skia, Core Graphics, Direct2D, or any graphics library that's available. The concepts in Color V1 are designed so that the operations are usually supported. For space efficiency, portions of such drawing recipes can be reused or even scaled and transformed, then re reused. Here's an example that describes the rendering of a glyph and how changing the graph can lead to a different result. A paint rotate operation is stacked with a paint glyph operation for drawing a star-shaped glyph from a contour in the font, followed by drawing a gradient as the fill for this star-shaped glyph. If you change the graph for this glyph, you can also place a different kind of fill there. Instead of just a gradient, we can fill it, for example, within the content of a whole different glyph for reusing that. Now, rendering this means we broke down this graph of operations and give the 2D graphics uh, library commands to execute these operations. First, we rotate the drawing surface, then we prepare to draw the star-shaped glyph contour and look for information how to fill it further down in the graph. Here we find the radial gradient. Executing these commands in sequence, we arrive at the rotated gradient-filled star shape. 
You could replace the paint radial gradient paint operation with a paint linear gradient or paint solid, and you would receive um, the the, ex, the the like the filling with a, just a solid color or a linear gradient instead. Also, instead of just a gradient, you can use other paint operations to paint groups of shapes and all combine them into one glyph image. So from the example graph that I showed at the beginning, changing the graph to have a paint color glyph instead of a paint radial gradient as the last operation means, fill the shape of the star glyph not with a gradient, but fill it with the image that you get when rendering another glyph that's also in the font. This allows reusing complex shapes. So this is a broad overview of how rendering in Color V1 works. Let's come back to using Color V1. Uh, Let's talk about the existing operations. Uh, this slide is a little bit full. Um, and it shows all the paint operations that are encoded in Color V1. Uh, I want to just highlight a few things here. Paint composite is important for compositing operations, combining several layers together with blend modes applied. Paint solid, paint linear gradient, paint radial gradient, and paint sweep gradients are most important for actually bringing color to the glyph. Paint transform, translate, scale, etc., are all paints that efficiently encode affine transformations. Most of the very most of the paint operations have variable counterparts, in which the effect of the paint operation can be modified by setting variation parameters on the font. For example, thinking about applying a rotation variation axis to the digits of a clock emoji glyph. I want to speak a little bit about how these uh, paint operations enable transform, uh, enable layer reuse. With these operations encoded in the color v1 format, we arrive at a highly space efficient encoding because we have such con concepts as paint color glyph for reusing existing glyphs and paint transforms, which can displace and reuse shapes in new positions. In this example, the cat's face outline and ears are the same. You recognize that there are many parts of it that can be reused from emoji to emoji. In the example of the ninja, only the skin tone changes. And this is a common pattern with several emoji that have skin tone, gender, or hairstyle modifiers applied. Thanks to the way we can encode reuse in color v1, we achieve highly efficient storage. In this example of the um, crystal ball, as you know, the crystal ball is an important tool for software engineers to perform effort estimates and debugging. We see as well that there are a couple of reusable shapes. So I mentioned OpenType SVG exists as an alternative format, and I do not want to go into a full comparison of Color V1 and OT SVG in this presentation. If you'd like to hear more details on this, uh, please contact me after the presentation and, and we can chat more on that. But let's take a look at how SVG and Color V1 relate when making Color V1 fonts. For Noto Emoji, all source images for our emoji set are stored as SVG images. SVGs are complex and to ease further processing and converting them to more space efficient format, we flatten them. The resultant, resulting flattened SVG has exactly one definition area, only groups and paths, only absolute coordinates, and it, um, all the clip paths are applied and all the strokes have been converted to paths. Then Nano Emoji, which is one of the tools we're using to make these fonts, features a stage where it automatically tries to identify shape reuse. Using Pico SVG, Nano Emoji, and font tools, we shift complexity away from the renderer to the font production pipeline. So we've seen how Color V1 works and how Color V1 fonts are produced. And we've heard that popular use cases such as emoji, mostly rather bitmap fonts are used. Let's see how Color V1 can change the game on the web here. For the Noto emoji font, the CBDT CBLC bitmap font is about nine megabytes large for the Unicode 14 uh, set of emoji. We can encode the same set of Noto Emoji Color V1 at a size of about 1.85 megabytes, while at the same time increasing rendering fidelity and scalability. 
This example gives a rough indication of the sharpness difference between the bitmap font on the right and the color v1 font on the left. In the Noto bitmap font, glyphs are stored at a fixed bitmap size of 128 pixels, whereas the color v1 glyph allows seamless scaling. The huge size of emoji bitmap fonts made it difficult to use them on the web, as the large download would block rendering or is not feasible. In many scenarios, thus, image replacement is used as a technique in which emoji glyphs are replaced with images. This, this needs uh, complex special handling of text selection, clipboard operations, and rendering. Here's an example of what WhatsApp on the web is doing using inline images instead of emoji glyphs from a font. Gmail and other Google properties employ similar techniques. With a compact color v1 as a web font, it becomes possible to overcome using image replacement and rely on regular font and text handling operations. Another strength of color v1 fonts is the ability to integrate with open type variations. All paint operations inside the color v1 specification allow external modification through variation parameters. For example, you could change the color stops of a gradient by applying a different set of variation parameters to the font. This enables animatable color glyphs on the web. So color v1 is about to be shipped in Chrome. If you'd like to try it out, you can go get the canary and enable the uh, color v1 flag in it. I, uh, I can also post a link to a code pen link, um, which actually uses the color v1 version of Noto directly from, um, from Google Fonts. How is this implemented in, in Chrome? Color v1 support in Chrome works independently of the operating system. For Chrome to support color v1, it's not required for the OS to support color v1. With the hybrid font stack in Chrome, we decide which font rasterizer to, be, uh, to use based on operating system support and the font format at hand. So if the OS doesn't support color v1, we switch to the open source stack rasterizer based on Skia and FreeType. With that, we will be able to bring color v1 in Chrome to Chrome OS, Android, Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. Support for Color V1 is based on software support in two open source software libraries. The FreeType software library understands the Color V1 table with the new definitions of paint operations that we defined for Color V1. And Skia applies these paint operations to a graphics context and to output them as, as color glyphs. Color v1 implementations do exist outside of Chrome already. There's the Black Foundry Python based renderer, and there are issues created for the uh, Rust uh, um, the Rust font library called Swash. In terms of shipping, the flag uh, is likely to be switched this week. Uh, the intent to ship got LGTM'd. Noteworthy positions from Microsoft and um, and Mozilla are presented on these slides, but I have to skip over them a little bit to keep uh, within the, with the time limit after starting a little bit late. So um, Microsoft and Mozilla both comment positively, um, and uh, we agree with them on the hope that Color V1 becomes the um, most useful and most widely used vector color font format on the web. Last but not least, a little outlook on what comes next. And I want to speak about feature detection, support for custom palettes, and elements of what might become color v2 or new features in color v1. Feature detection is currently discussed in the CSS working group. This is what the syntax might look like. So we will get um, a font technology CSS conditional function with which you can check whether color v1 is available and then use CSS um, to load your color v1 font. This, AP, uh, this, this conditional function would also work in a CSS supports and allows you to programmatically detect uh, support for color v1. 
at the beginning of the presentation, I was talking about material design two-tone icons. Um, and so far, it would mean that the font palette on, and the colors for these two-tone icons needs to be encoded in the font. But when we ship uh, font palette support in the future, then it allows you to also apl um, apply CSS styling on the palette of the font. So changing these kind of two-tone uh, colors to different colors of your choice. In terms of features for a future version of Color V1, um, we might add bitmap embedding support. It's a feature of OpenType SVG that might be relevant for Color V1 as well, even though that, of course, has effects on the scalability. Filter effects uh, such as blur, lighting, or shadows might be interesting for adding drop shadows. Bitmap pa patterns and mesh gradients are also requested features. Also, CPAL palette enhancements might be relevant here. So far, the CPAL palette uh, encodes everything in RGB values. And so additional color spaces, white color gamut support for the palette might be useful additions as well. To recap, Color V1 is a highly space efficient color font format. It enables new use cases on the web as the small file size becomes reasonable to download to clients. It provides high rendering fidelity and scalability and has the potential to deprecate image replacement. Color V1 is implemented and ready to ship in Chrome's hybrid font stack. Thank you, and thanks for joining this session. I'd like to also give a shout out to my colleagues, Rod Sheeter and Cosimo Lupo from Google Fonts, Berat Esfabot, and um, who was author or co-author at the very beginning of the specification, and Peter Constable from Microsoft, Ben Wagner from the Skia team, Werner Lemberg from the FreeType project, who all made, helped, who all helped uh, make Color V1 happen.